We are your hosts, Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and you are listening to the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice, brought to you by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology to highlight work published in our peer-reviewed journal, HIC. Join us as we speak to those in the field of infection prevention and control, like us, as well as other experts to learn about some of the latest research in the field and how it can be put into practice. We hope you will listen in, learn something new, and apply this information to your work. If you are not a researcher already, we hope this podcast will get you thinking about areas where you can carry out your own research. Hey, Jess, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am so good. It is always good to hear your voice. How's your kitchen renovation going? <laughs> Slowly but surely. <laughs> do, do you have all the, the ICRA? Did you have an ICRA put up and all the barriers? I did. I felt um, very <laughs> adept at understanding what was going on. So that was good. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Uh, well, I can't wait to see pictures of it when you're done with it. Are you ready for this month's joke? I am always ready and waiting. Okay. Uh, what did the memory B cell say to the E. coli? What? I'll never forget you. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, Jess. So we are talking about an infection prevention nightmare today. Okay. So imagine an outbreak on your COVID unit and all the complexities that go into that. And we've got with us today, Rachel Gran, Kelsey Canavan, and Dr. Paula Eckert. They are here to talk to us about that very situation. And they're going to go into their article titled, Containment of a Carbapenem Resistant Acinetobacter Bumani Complex Outbreak in a COVID-19 Intensive Care Unit. Uh, and that's a mouthful to say. So instead of carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter bomani, we're going to refer to it as crab from here on out. So first, yeah, I know. <laughs> so first, a little bit about our guests. Rachel Gran has a master's in public health, a BSN, and her CIC, and is the director of epidemiology and infection prevention at the Memorial Healthcare System. She's worked in infection prevention and control for nine years. She's passionate about adding to the body of literature and healthcare epidemiology and infection prevention, translating new research into clinical best practices and policy creation. She is currently in the DRPH program at the University of South Florida, and you can see Rachel's dedication to health promotion through her YouTube music videos on hand washing and influenza vaccination. And I got to say, I can't wait to check those out. Next, we've got Kelsey Canavan, who is an infection preventionist at Memorial Regional Hospital. She was previously the manager of infection control at Memorial Hospital Miramar. She holds a master's of public health and a master's in public administration and is also CIC. She's worked in infection prevention and control for nine years and is passionate about sterilization, high-level disinfection, and working with IT to enhance surveillance software and reports that aid the Memorial Healthcare System infection prevention team. Paula Eckert, MD, FACP, FIDSA, AAHIVS, is the Chief Division of Infectious Disease, Medical Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Control, and the Medical Director of MHS Ryan White Clinic at the Memorial Healthcare System in Hollywood, Florida. Busy lady. Dr. Eckert is also a Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine FIU Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine and Affiliate Assistant Professor of Clinical Biomedical Science FAU College of Medicine. So welcome, team. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. So this study seems to have been prompted by the detection of crab in six ICU patients. Can you kick off our talk by telling us how these patients were identified? Um, yeah, so I'll take that one. I, I first received a call actually about a meropenem resistant acinetobacter. It was the day before Thanksgiving. So almost all of the leadership was actually at home for the day cooking just like you normally would. Um, I immediately called and started to cohort the group of the, the patient. Um, we then the next day got a call with a couple more patients and that trend continued for about a week. Um, 
it took, you know, everybody that was there, uh, you know, boots on the ground, you know, because the interim leadership um, had to really step up and put everything into practice um, that we were telling them to do at the time. All hands on deck, and it's always on a holiday or a Friday at four, isn't it? <laughs> that is how it works mm-hmm. in the infection prevention world. <laughs> yep. Fantastic. So can you talk to us a little bit about why crab infections are more concerning than some other bacterial infections, including what the expected mortality rates would be and what are the current available treatment options for crab? As you all know, this is a very difficult to, to treat uh, bacteria. It usually is multidrug resistant. And uh, in our case, it was very difficult to treat. Um, they also reached out to me to, to help with the treatment because the patients had actually not a lot of um, antibiotics that they could use. And, um, and since most of them were the same organism because they had more or less the same sensitivities, we came up with an action plan for uh, treatment. Mortality is very high, especially in patients that already are in the ICU with COVID and severe COVID. Most of our, most of our patients or all of our patients were intubated and were on, on continuous dialysis. So they were already very, very sick with COVID. So the mortality was probably imminent. And then, um, you know, they, they got infected with the acinetobacter on top of it. And so we know that that probably um, aggravated the whole situation. But I think that um, the patients were already at dire, you know, risk of dying even without having this infection. Um, so we came up with, with a plan of treatment, uh, but it was um, uh, uh, multiple antibiotics at the same time. We, we uh, were able to, to get um, genetic testing for resistance uh, and we were able to identify the gene that was actually causing the uh, panel of resistance, which it was uh, OXA 23. And so um, we also got um, some of the outside labs to help us identify um, if the, the organism was sensitive to polymyxin or um, uh, um, uh, cephedericol um, and um, um, Havicas, for example, and the, it, you know, it was it was very minimal what we could do. So we actually end up um, adding uh, three different antibiotics and an aminoglycoside to help out the patients, which I don't think made any in- create, great impact in their outcomes. That is a lot of work for Thanksgiving holiday, oh. but uh, yeah, like I said, all hands on deck. Well, yeah. It, 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 yeah, all hands on deck. We we had to uh, work with our stewardship partners, like the pharmacists. We worked with mm-hmm. the microbiology lab. We worked with our um, lab scientists uh, and leadership at the hospitals. And so, you know, we came up with a plan, but I think the patients were, were already very, very sick yeah, to begin yeah. with. It's interdisciplinary uh, teamwork. Now, unfortunately, it does look like all the infection, all the, all the infected patients expired. What was the expected contribution of the crab on death in the presence of COVID uh, patients and multiple cor- comorbidities? Well, I think that, I, like I, I said before, um, the patients were already on like continuous dialysis. They were intubated. They had um, severe COVID pneumonia. Um, they were they've been in the in the ICU for a prolonged period of time. Uh, by the time this happened, so I think that um, definitely this this didn't help the patients, but I don't think the patients were going to get better anyways mm-hmm. okay. because they were very very advanced with the COVID disease. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate for sure. Um, so there were a lot of you know, parts and wheels moving as you realized that you had this situation going on. And the article mentions that there was a screening process put in place for high-risk admissions. What did that screening process look like? I can answer that. So we we have adopted that using EPIC, our electronic medical record, uh, across the system for admissions um, with high-risk factors 
for uh, CRE and C. auris because we have seen an increase on some of these um, multi-drug resistant organisms, especially proliferating during COVID, as evidenced by the literature as well in our in a, and in our current um, South Florida area. What would some of those? Um, what would Epic be looking for? So. Epic is looking for um, a nurse to ask those questions if they are coming from a high risk facility, um, if they've traveled outside of the country, and some of the other high risk factors for carbapenem resistant organisms. But I also think this question was probably related to the point prevalence screenings that we did once the um, six cases, the six clinical cases were identified. So I'll let Kelsey answer that screening. Yes. So we we immediately uh, the Monday following the holiday came in and we screened all of the patients within our COVID ICU and our non-COVID ICU. Um, we actually extended that to find some other patients that were in our telemetry units that had been in transferred out of the ICU during that time frame. So we, we did a very robust screening of a lot of patients, um, one swab of the axilla and groin on all patients. We did throat, throat cultures on some patients as well if they were re receiving respiratory care, uh, ventilator or trach, because the first, um, the first actual specimen we had was from a sputum culture. So we thought that could have been a source. Um, we, we identified, I think, one patient from that screening. And then we did two additional screenings, I think, every two weeks. Um, and until, and what, once we had two negative screenings um, on those following two, uh, over a four week time period, we decided that the outbreak had ceased. Um, we implemented this, this allowed us to identify all of the patients who could have been exposed during the time period um, when the initial uh, index case had not been isolated. Um, and that is really the point of screening is to go out and, and find anybody who may still be maybe infectious and maybe um, causing, you know, cross contamination and transmission to other patients. Um, it's so much stuff goes into a situation like this. So beyond, you know, uh, screening and culturing, you know, when the outbreak was detected, it mentions that the hospital closed the unit down to new admissions or transfers, cohorted exposed patients, you limited staff entry and utilized telehealth as appropriate. How was all of that received? Yes. So this was actually very well received um, because we had the full support of our administration. Um, the CNO had actually had experience working in a level five biocontainment unit, and he understood the need for containment, communication, and identifi identification of other potential cases. Awesome. So that, that was really extremely beneficial. Um, we did close the unit to new admissions while we waited for those surveillance cultures to finalize. Um, and as I stated previously, we completed two rounds of point prevalence screening um, to determine that the transmission had ceased. We continued keeping the unit closed until we had it fully terminally cleaned, and we did a final disinfection with vaporized hydrogen peroxide. As we know, acinetobacter can remain um, alive on surfaces and fomites for a long period of time. So we wanted to make sure that we had fully disinfected the entire area. Um, we did communicate with all leadership every single morning in a huddle to keep everybody abreast of the current situation, the plan for the day, any issues that we had seen, um, and really communication was key. Um, the staff was very receptive to all of the protocols that we put in place, and they understood what we were doing and why we were doing it. And really educating the staff is always one of the most important pieces of this. They need to understand that it's non-punitive. We don't know how it occurred, but something occurred, and now we need to take steps to make sure that nobody else get sick. Um, as an infection preventionist, it, it is always extremely important that we communicate our work closely with our administration um, and that we really over communicate as much as possible. And I'll add to that, that um, this, this particular case and what we've also seen um, already published about outbreaks of multi-drug resistant organisms in COVID units you know, there is so many things that we were doing in the beginning of the pandemic um, that were not standard infection control practices. We were doing it um, across the country from blessings from our regulatory bodies. 
um, to try to conserve PPE, um, to keep our healthcare workers safe. So some of those things that we mentioned in the paper about um, they had externalized IVs, they were doing med prep right outside the room, um, they were wearing PPE inappropriately from room to room. There was double gloving um, found on rounds. So a lot of these things needed to go back to the basics, back to our regular standard infection control. And all of that came with education on why. Why don't we wear the same gown room to room and why it's important to practice these um, standard and enhanced contact precautions? Yeah, it Definitely, we've had this conversation in, in multiple um, articles that we've discussed about um, some of these measures that were sort of sunset as a result of the pandemic. Um, but it sounds like you all did a, a lot of work and a lot of communication and a lot of education to help right the ship again. Um, but one of the questions that I had um, that I've, I've actually seen done in the past, and I was curious if this was part of um, one of those measures, was if you had actually um, cultured any of the staff to see if there was any colonization amongst the staff. No, we, we did not. Actually, the staff continued to request to be to be cultured. Um, however, that is not a practice um, in a normally healthy individual. And if the proper PPE is utilized for, and donning and doffing is done properly, um, the staff should remain unaffected. Um, so the staff was not cultured, nor was the environment. Um, we were able to determine that the transmission was from contact transmission with either people um, or fomites, because when we reinstituted those traditional infection prevention measures and utilizing a new gown and gloves for every single patient every single time, along with continually, continu continu sorry, continuously wiping down and disinfecting equipment and dedicating equipment to this group, we did see that the outbreak um, had ceased. Awesome. I am so glad you talked about how healthcare personnel COVID experience, you know, changed and probably continued or con contributed to the issue, you know, like PPE conservation and wearing them from room to room and IV poles outside of the rooms, med preps outside of the rooms, reduced hand hygiene compliance. But your article goes into a lot of that. And I thought that was um, important to address how, how co the COVID experience really contributed to that. But I, I want to change a little bit and talk about the respiratory therapists. I know they were changing the ventilator circuits and, and tubing and suctions and the canisters daily. So how did this and other interventions kind of further exacerbate the supply strain issues during COVID? And were there any other unexpected sources of resource depletion? Not during this time period. Again, because of our um, extreme support from the administration of the hospital and the system, we, we were able to, um, you know, by calculating our burn rate for all of our supplies throughout the pandemic, we were able to keep enough supplies even to, to do this, um, you know, enhanced measure at the hospital. That's that's good. I worried when I read the article just about all of the stuff that goes on, and now you've got <laughs> the extra burden of doing all the ventilator circuits and tubings and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. and, and I wondered if, um, you know, I was thinking you, you have to have dedicated EVS staff, education of staff. You know, it's a very multifaceted approach that EVS had to take to clean, which you talked a little bit about that earlier in some of the, the steps that were taken. But that had to have taken a lot more time. Was there was there an increase in room turnover time? Absolutely. And, and as we stated, you know, because we worked so closely with the administration, they understood that there was going to be that downstream effect. Um, we actually had to, you know, get some more um, contract personnel to bring them in to clean other parts of the hospital um, so that we could staff our our, our COVID ICU where the outbreak occurred um, 24 seven with environmental techs. Uh, we also learned that their shifts work a little bit differently. So we had to find ways to cover, to cover the gaps so that we continuously had somebody in there working and disinfecting and cleaning all of the equipment and common areas. And, and, you know, I, I went multiple times and educated the environmental services group 
about uh, Acinobacter, about the outbreak, about what was occurring and about what we were doing. Um, because just like the nursing team and the clinical team, you know, they also needed to understand why we were doing it, what we were doing and how they were going to help. Um, and really bringing them in and giving them, empowering them is what I found um, always works best uh, with all of your staff. And then that goes for environmental services as well, because they are a huge, a huge factor in the chain of infection prevention. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, um, I love to think of the environmental services people as part of the infection prevention team. Um, and I think that, you know, highlighting their importance is, is just critical in, in helping them understand and, and, you know, do things like the way that they need to be done. Um, so I don't know about you, Nikki, but I think that this is a fantastic article and really highlights um, overall the importance of all of the infection preventionists out there and all of the infection prevention practices that we are um, all working so hard to put in place. Um, so I'd like to ask you ladies, um, what are your biggest takeaways for listeners today? Uh, um, I would say my biggest takeaways are that, you know, it, it really does take a team. It takes everybody um, working together in tandem to contain an outbreak. Um, you know, identifying all of the stakeholders and keeping everybody abreast of what is going on um, on a daily basis, if not m multiple times per day, depending on what is happening. Um, additionally, you know, boots on the ground, you have to be out there and you have to be looking and watching and observing. We also had an observer on the unit 24-7 um, to make sure that, you know, people, you know, people are, are human. Um, we, we, we make mistakes. We do things that we don't realize that we are doing. Um, and it takes another set of eyes to to really point that out to us. So um, that is the biggest takeaway I had from the entire thing. For me, I think that um, it highlights uh, through the system the importance of oh, the infection preventionist job, um, as, as well as other members, such as like uh, the EBS personnel and the microbiology lab and everybody that helped through this, including the pharmacist stewardship. Um, you know, I think that the doctors uh, uh, take off our hats to the work that this the girls do and everybody do across the, the system to try to prevent infections. And also that we have to go back to basics. Uh, I know that everybody with the pandemic, you know, we started trying to make things a little bit different because everybody was scared and and you know we changed some of our practices and and we have to realize that we have to continue just going but by, by what we know works and just um hopefully we don't have another pandemic but if we do um just be better prepared for next time and um just you know do the the usual uh prevention that we were always taught and I'll say my biggest takeaway is um, how important communication is within the hospital. Every single department um, needs to be aware that this is happening. Um, they need to be able to speak to it. They need to all hands on deck in the hospital at every level, every type of department. Um, and then how important communication was for us to share this with our APIC partners, our you know um, local chapters to share this in, to get published in AGIC, um, to do this podcast, because the more that this gets out there, other infection preventionists around the country, they can take these papers, they can go to their administration, they can get the resources Couldn't they agree need. more. Well, I'd like to thank you, Rachel, Kelsey, and Paula for being with us today. Um, we really appreciate that you took the time to do the research and publish an article because you're right, it, it definitely um, just gets more information out to all of us um, and helps create that network. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for joining us today. We are Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and this is the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice. Thanks for listening and doing your part to prevent infection because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. To hear other AGIC podcast episodes and to access information about this podcast in the field of infection prevention and control, go to our website at agicscienceintopractice.org. 
That's A-G-I-C, scienceintopractice.org. AGIC Science into Practice is created by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology with input from the APIC Research Committee and Pat Stone and Jean Brandt at AGIC and APIC staff, Lisa Tomlinson, Liz Garman, Bobby Golshin, Chris Ruiz, Kelly Lynn Russell, Sylvia Quevedo, Kaylee Deaton, and Christine Miller. We work in partnership with Human Factor and Audio Tech Blake Alton. 